Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This is the part of scripture that we've been focusing on all summer long. And if I'm honest with you, when I read this, I really like the first half of verse eight. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Sounds nice, right? It's so nice. It sounds great. I don't love the second half of that verse where James is like, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. <laughs> Purify your hearts. I tried to do the voice. It's not going to work. I don't love that second half. If I'm honest, when I read that second half, I kind of question. I'm like, what is, what, why? Why is he saying this? What does sin have to do with drawing near to God? I thought that was Old Testament. This is New Testament. We're living in a new covenant. Double-minded. Ouch. Ah. That's not for me. <laughs> that's for them. That's not for me. That's for them. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. I wonder why that's there. Has anybody else ever read that and kind of just like skimmed over it at best? Like maybe just kind of like, yeah, 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 yeah. For them, Lord, for them, for them. Has anybody ever stopped to wonder why James says this part about sin? And double-mindedness? I think in order to best understand what James is saying, like we saw in the video, it's important to look at context a little bit. There's this passage in Psalm 24 that James seems to be pulling from in this scripture. It says this in verse 3 to 4, Psalm 24. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. The psalmist writes, who can stand in God's presence? Who can be found in his holy place? One who has clean hands and a pure heart. It seems like James is directly quoting it. Or if we go back to the book of James and zoom out a little bit more and go to verse four, it says this. You adulterous people, don't you know that the friendship with, that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Anyone who chooses friendship with the world becomes an enemy of God. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Hmm. The message that James is communicating here is quite clear. And although we don't like to hear it sometimes, I think this morning the Lord wants to draw us to this passage in our pursuit of him. Because if we don't deal with some important things that are going on in our lives, the sin and the brokenness and the impurities of our heart, our double-mindedness, then I fear at times that we, will, we may never fully encounter the Lord's presence as he intended. And that should sit heavy on our hearts. And I know this isn't the sermon <laughs> that we all want to hear sometimes. But as we conclude our series on drawing near to God, we would be missing something if we didn't talk about our sin. So the message that he communicates is clear. Our friendship is divided. Our loyalty, our allegiance is divided, not just by our actions, not just by the things we find our hands doing, but by our hearts as well. Not just the things we do, but the things that our hearts dwell on. The misplaced loves and affections and attentions. For what we give our attention to, we worship. But we don't want that, right? And, and here's another important piece of context for you. James is not talking to people who don't know Jesus. 
He's not talking to people outside of the church. He's solely talking to those who follow Jesus. Because if he was talking to people outside the church, it might look a little different. It might look more like what Jesus had to say. Hey, repent, for the kingdom of God isn't near. But he's talking to followers of Jesus. And he's inviting them to wash their hands and purify their hearts. And the thing is, is there is a war happening within us. We know this because in Romans, Paul writes this in in chapter 7, verse 21. He says this, I find that there's this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. This is Paul writing. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And so, instead of drawing near to God, at times we find ourselves pulling away from him because we still have friendship with the world, despite our desire. We are double-minded. This morning we sing what a beautiful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. What a powerful name it is. You have no rival. You have no equal. And at times when I sing this song, I feel the Holy Spirit come close and he says, is that really true? It is true, but is it true in here for me? Is it true in there for you? When you sing those words, God, you have no rival in my heart. Is it true? And so what do we do? What a wretched man I am. Who will save me? (laughs) How can we become single-minded again? How can we reject our friendship with the world, however partial it may be? This morning, the title of our message, if you're taking notes, is called Holy Hygiene, because why not? How can we break our bondage from the world? How can we sever ties, even if it's just a little string, to the old desires of our hearts? How can we be made whole again towards the Lord? Well, James says it quite clearly right there. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Wash your hands and purify your hearts. I want you to turn to your neighbor this morning and tell him, wash your hands. Now, that's just good advice. That's just good advice. Hygiene is important. Can I get an amen? There is nothing more uncomfortable than going to a public bathroom and seeing people not wash their hands. Are you with me? It's nasty. It's nasty. And, and I'm sure they're using hand sanitizer after. I'm sure. They're like, well, I didn't want to touch the dirty doorknob on my way out. And I'm like, there's no door. We're at the saddle dome. No, just joking. Wash your hands. See, when James is saying this, and when we see these these words throughout Scripture, it's a nod to both Old and New Testament thoughts around the symbolic act of cleansing. In the Old Testament, we see God give Moses a command to uh, tell Aaron to wash his hands before he stands before the Ark of the Covenant for fear that he may die. Crazy. We see priests and, and many people throughout the Bible perform a cleansing ceremony before entering the presence of God. We see cleansing ceremonies after touching something impure. That's why many people wouldn't even interact with lepers and people who had diseases. But Jesus would. That's another sermon for another time. We see Pilate wash his hands of any guilt that he may feel that he had for sending Jesus to the cross. In other words, 
The Old Testament view and some New Testament views of washing hands was a way of cleansing oneself of the physical things that they have touched or done in order that they may enter the presence of God clean. But again, I really want to emphasize this. James is not inviting us to sing the happy birthday song twice after we go to the bathroom. That's not what he's doing here. He's not asking us to practice good hygiene, although that is good advice. And he certainly isn't asking us or inviting us back to an Old Testament ancient view of cleansing ceremonies and sacrificial laws. That's not what he's doing either. He's inviting us, and I want you to hear this, he's inviting us to confront our sin and to come before the cross and receive a cleansing that only Christ can provide. We used to sing, what can wash me white as snow? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. How can we be made clean again? To clean our hands, to wash them, is to pray the prayer that David prayed in Psalm 51. It's to say, have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, wash away all of my iniquity, all of my sin, and cleanse me from my sin. We need to become aware of the things our hands are doing. Not our physical hands, you know what I'm saying. And I think as followers of Jesus, we like to cling to the new life that God has given us, and it's a good thing. His grace is free. Hear that this morning. And where sin abounds, grace abounds even more, but... We need to be very careful that we do not continue on in our sin, ignoring what we do. We need to wash our hands. Hmm. Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, purify your heart. No, 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 come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's, okay, deep breath, everyone, okay? It got heavy. It's gonna get heavy again. Let's just one, okay. Okay, now turn to your other neighbor and say, purify your heart. Come on, let them smell your breath. All right. So James says, wash your hands, you sinners. Ouch. And then he says this, purify your hearts, you double-minded. He invites us to purify our hearts because we are double-minded. He invites us to continue praying the prayer that David prayed in Psalm 51. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew in me a steadfast spirit. Church, I wonder what kind of things What kinds of things have taken the seat of affection in our hearts apart from him? See, our our sin, the things that we know we shouldn't do but do anyway, or the things that we know we ought to do but don't, that's one thing. The outward stuff, that's one thing. But God's not just after the outward stuff, he's actually after the inward stuff. He's after our hearts. And so this morning, or rather this this afternoon, I wanna invite you to just quiet your mind 
to hear what the Lord is saying. To maybe pray the same prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139. Lord, point out anything in my heart, anything going on in here that offends you. And lead me in the ways everlasting. See, John the Baptist said this in Matthew. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance. I wash you as a symbol of repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not even worthy to carry. He, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. See, when we read what James says to purify our hearts, we're actually praying something. We're asking the Holy Spirit to come and burn away the impurities that live in us still. We're asking him to refine us by fire so that only what is pure remains. We say, God, would you baptize me by your spirit? Would you lead me down the path of sanctification? Would you make me more like you? Would you help me be holy as you are holy? Not just on the outside, which matters, but on the inside, which is what you're after. And as we begin to go on that process, God begins to burn away the things that plague our inner life, that distract us, or that destroy us until all that's left is him. If I can invite the keys back up. It is in the baptism of fire that we find our faith refined, that we find it pure again, that we come back to our first love, that we put him on the throne room of our heart, We have to be careful how often we throw around the word love. We have to be careful. And I'm not saying you're, you should avoid using the words, I love pizza. That's not what I'm saying. I love pizza. But I wonder how many subtle loves you have hidden in your heart for things that are not of God's kingdom. Later on in in James chapter four, he, he gets even more intense and he says, you need to start grieving again. Mourn. I think we need to start grieving over our sin again. We need to recognize it for what it is and we need to grieve over the parts of our heart that are divided and invite the Holy Spirit to burn away the things not of Him. In a time of my life, I, um, it's okay for me to be vulnerable, I think for a moment. There was a time in my life where I felt often just stuck in a cycle of distraction from the Lord. It wasn't like I was the prodigal son off gallivanting in a faraway land. That's not what I'm saying. But I, I know that there's been times in my life where I've become distracted in my heart. I need to come back again and again and again. This November marks 16 years since I gave my life to Jesus. And I remember the moment so clearly because I was in a room, nothing like this. It was like a dusty hut. (laughs) But I remember this moment 
where I was sitting in a pew. I'd never gone to church before. I didn't know how to do any of the stuff that we do in church, but I, I remember sitting there and, and there was somebody speaking, but I stopped listening at some point. I invite you this morning to stop listening to me if you feel the Lord tugging on your heart. And what happened was, is in my head, I started to just get this highlight reel of my life before Christ. And if I can be honest, at times, I'm ashamed of who I was. And when I read Paul talk about being the chief of all sinners, I'm like, me too. But I saw what I, my life looked like. It was like the Holy Spirit was playing this film. And I know at times we talk about hearing God's voice and it, it can be cheesy at some, at sometimes, it can be a little bit disingenuine, but in that moment, I heard Jesus speaking to my heart. And he, he, it was like he was like pointing at the, the movie and he was like, you see that? That's your life. And I know where it's headed. And I felt the Lord invite me into a new way of living. He asked me, do you want a fresh start? And I said, yes, I do. And Jesus said, if you trust in me, if you put your faith in me and give me your life, give me your heart, I will give you a clean slate. Those are the words I remember so clearly, clean slate. So I gave my life to the Lord. And in that moment, I decided very, very clearly, I'm not going to give my heart to the things of this world anymore. I can't because they lead to death. And I, I gave my heart to Jesus that day, that night, I said, you can have my whole life, my whole heart, Lord. And for me, life with Jesus is a fresh start. I am a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Amen? And as we conclude this series about drawing near to God, encountering his loving presence, his kindness, his mercy, his grace, I think it's important for us to recognize what our hands do and where our heart is in order to invite God to work in us, remove distraction, and make us single-minded towards Him again. Do you want to draw near to God? then we need to start by washing our hands, receive the cleansing of his blood. And we need to welcome the Holy Spirit to purify our hearts once more. Can I invite you to bow your heads and maybe close your eyes if that's helpful? This morning, if you are here and you do not have a relationship with Jesus, if you've never made a decision to give him your heart, give him your life, to make him the leader of all that you do, I want to invite you to make a decision this morning to kill your allegiance to this world and to give your heart, your love, your affection to Jesus. Because our sin and our double-minded hearts can draw us away from him, but when we invite him in, he cleanses us and purifies us. And we can have right relationship with God again. So if you're here and you would like to receive Jesus into your life as Lord and leader. 
I want to invite you to pray a prayer with me. And before I do, I just want to ask you to raise your hand so I know who I'm praying with. If that's you this morning, yeah, amen. Just raise your hand nice and high so I can see it. Yeah, amen, amen. Yeah. God loves you so much. Would you pray with me if this is you? Jesus, thank you for your death on the cross. That as Adam even shared earlier, has paid the debt of our sin. And where sin has come to divide us from you, to separate us from you, I thank you that your love is separated by nothing. And this morning, I receive you into my heart, into my life, to receive your love, to receive your grace. And I confess that you are Lord. No longer will I follow the way of the world. From here on out, I follow you. Would you help me and love me? In Jesus' name. And let's just remain in this posture for a moment. I'm gonna call the prayer team to come up now. And it's a little tight at the front, that's okay. This place is booming. And in prayer team, if you can just kind of spread out as much as possible, um, that'd be helpful. If you're an elder um, or a pastor, pastoral staff at the church, I'd invite you to come up now as well. And what I'd love for you all to do is right now, could you just stand to your feet? We're gonna close here in a moment. But I wanna just pray one more time for those of us in the room who have been following the Lord. And hear me, that we have become distracted in our hearts. Not by our desire or intention, but slowly and subtly we've allowed things to take the place of Jesus in our heart. And I want to invite you this morning, if that is you, if you feel the Lord speaking to you, if you feel God highlighting things and convicting things in your heart, I want to invite you to come up and just pray with somebody because the Bible says this, that when we confess our sin to one another, he is faithful to forgive those things, to cleanse us and make us righteous. And this isn't the old school form of confession. This is us inviting you to come and pray with somebody who will minister to you and love on you. So if that's you, I'm gonna pray, but I wanna invite you to just to even start making your way to the front now. This is a church and we need to be vulnerable again. We need to stop pretending like everything's good. We need to be real with one another, amen? Amen. So if that's you, just come to the front and receive prayer. Jesus, I thank you so much for your loving kindness. I thank you that you are not done with us. You're not finished with us. And that yes, our hearts and our desire is to live for you, but at times we get distracted. At times we fall back to our old habits and at times we find ourselves in cycles of sin or double-mindedness. And this afternoon, God, I, I pray and I ask for all of us here that by your spirit, you would help us by pointing out the things in our hearts, in our lives that are not of you. Help us to live our lives on paths of righteousness in the ways everlasting. And God, as we draw near to you and you draw near to us, would you create in us a pure heart and restore to us the joy of our salvation? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for assembling.